speciation session. Uh, my name is Andrew Edelman, and I'm the moderator. I'm also giving the first talk, so hopefully I can keep on track and not get off time here. Um, I'll apologize right away. This actually is only tangentially related to um, evolution and speciation, but hopefully that's okay with you guys. Um, I was a PhD student here with Astrid, um, and I graduated in 2010. Although I worked on kangaroo rats, so many people assume that I'm one of Jim's PhD <laughs> students. But I'm, I'm proud to be Astrid's uh, PhD student, if that's okay with me. But Jim was on my committee as well, and he was very influential to uh, my research. And I have another connection. I'm a postdoc right now at the University of Wyoming, finishing up a two-year bioinformatics postdoc with Dave McDonald, who was one of Astrid's first PhD students. So it's kind of come full circle here. And so today I'm going to be talking to you about complexity of long-tailed mannequins uh, societies using social network techniques to see how these societies are structured. Uh, move forward here. Okay. And when we think of social complexity, we often think, think of these guys. Us here in the room, things like dolphins, other primates, um, elephants, those kinds of things. And there's even a hypothesis that's very prevalent, especially in the primate literature, called the social brain hypothesis that says we have cognitive complexity or large brain um, size that goes hand in hand with this social complexity, complex societies. So what is social complexity? It's a little bit vague. There's no specific definition. Um, but when we look at um, these different societies that we typically think of being complex, we have these different hallmarks. Uh, we think of cooperation being very common in these societies, often with non-kin as well as kin. We, obviously, space is very important in, with who you interact. Um, typically, these are spatially proximate interactions, although in humans, we're kind of moving beyond this with the internet and other forms of long-distance communication. Um, Long-term social bonds are also very important. We tend to interact with the same individuals over our lifetime again and again. And then this comes from uh, the social sciences, uh, social network literature, this idea of interdependent triadic interactions being very important as well. Um, and what I mean by triadic interactions is represented by this little pictogram over there where you have the circles representing different individuals um, in a society. And the triad is kind of one of the basic um, structures that we look at in societies. And in this case, in most of societies, we see that individuals that share connections with another individual, such as in this top um, diagram, end up also forming connections with themselves. So we see a lot of this, what we call triad closure, where you get all three individuals interacting with each other. It's also termed a friend of a friend type of effect, if you've heard that in the popular literature at all. And so these ideas raise the question um, right away, do we need to have social complexity and cognitive complexity go hand in hand. Is this a requirement? I think Dave and I would maybe argue that we might have a good exception to this maybe general rule with the long-tailed mannequins. This is a small tropical bird. They're, typically, they're about the size of a house sparrow, actually a little bit smaller in size. They're a lek breeding bird as well. Um, the cool thing about them is, unlike a lot of lek breeding birds, such as you might think sage grouse or something like that, these guys aren't just um, in it for themselves, they're actually doing cooperative displays to um, attract females to their lek site, in this case, a central perch zone. So typically, um, you have two males who will do all sorts of synchronized dances and calls that attract them, attract females to these sites to breed, and at any um, set, what we call perch area, uh, there may be 8 to 15 males interacting, doing cooperative displays and calls. They're unrelated, which is a neat Thing about this system, there's not this. It's not uh, related to kin at all. Um, also, the neat thing about this system is that um, if any male breeds, it's typically only the top alpha male at that uh, perch or lek site. Um, the other males are hopefully going to receive some sort of delayed benefit um, if they increase the reputation of that lek site and then eventually move up to the reproductive male. There's a quick video showing you some of their synchronized calls and displays that they do. Get this to play. There we go. Okay, I guess the sound isn't going, but they're doing a leapfrog here, these two males. They're also doing a synchronized call. There's some drab females here on this perch watching them. And they go off and do other types of 
um, displays as well, and they do thousands of these displays over their lifetime. So very intricate cooperation, cooperative society here among the males. So one of the questions we wanted to look at was use social network techniques, which provide a more holistic approach to looking at network structure or, or, or structure of these societies to really look at what influences the formation of what's going on in this um, society of man male mannequins. And we wanted to see if, are these processes similar to what we see in large brain mammals like dolphins and humans? Do we see the same types of network processes going on? So, I'm gonna use the royal we, even though I, I didn't collect any data. I've never seen a mannequin in my life, besides <laughs> what's on the video. But what Dave did really was go down from 1983 to 1998 and collect data on mannequins. He has a wonderful data set from Costa Rica uh, where these animals are quite plentiful. Um, it covers 16 years and has over 10,000 hours of observation. And so we were able to, based on the amount of data we have, break these into two-year chunks. Um, the cooperative interactions that Dave um, uh, observed of these males at their, at their lex sites. And that allowed us to look at how consistent were the processes um, that formed these networks over time. So we had eight specific networks that we were able to, to create out of this 16-year period. And I should also mention that we assigned uh, each male uh, spatial location um, in their two-year network based on where they spent most of their time. They do move around a little bit, um, but typically they spend most of their time at one um, central perch zone displaying with the males there. And we did a variety of exploratory types of analyses to look at what potential um, processes might be important to forming these social networks. Um, part of my postdoc was to bring in some new, more statistically rigorous techniques to um, social network analysis, specifically in animal uh, social networks, um, because it's still a very emerging field. And so what I did was use a more statistically rigorous technique to look at what processes were important to forming these networks called exponential random graph modeling, or ERGM for short. This is a technique from the social sciences, which are much more advanced in their analyses of social networks. And it's very similar to logistic regression. I'm not gonna go into too much detail. Essentially what it's doing is just looking, trying to model the probability that a social link exists based on a set of predictor variables. Um, and it's almost essentially the same to logistic regression, except in this case, um, the data points are independent because they're all within the same social network, so they're dyadic dependent. And because of that, we can't use typical maximum likelihood methods to fit a model like you would with logistic regression. We have to use uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo simulations to fit the model. And what I did was look at, based on our exploratory analysis, three uh, possible effects. And, and I looked at different combinations of these effects to see which combination was the best fit for our eight networks. And what I found was that for all eight networks, all 16 years, that these three effects um, together um, were the best model. So spatial proximity, how close were males located, triad closure um, was also important, and these long-term interactions. Did a male um, interact with another male in a previous two-year time period? So let's look a little more at the detail of those models, what the results were. And these are just average over our eight models because the trends were the same um, for all those different models. But first looking at the effect of spatial proximity. So were they at the same spatial location or were they located farther away? And that's what this little thing is depicting here. These two birds are at the same location. And what I found was that on average they were over two and a half times more likely um, to cooperate in these interactions if they were at the same perch zone than if they were farther away. So space is really important to who you're going to interact with, who you're going to end up cooperating with. And that makes sense. We tend to cooperate more with people at our spatial locations, like our own university region and so on. Next, I looked at the effect of a previous interaction. So did they actually interact um, in a previous two-year network? And that's what's represented by this little pictogram here, two males that had interacted in the previous network. And what I found was that on average, uh, for all those networks, that 
uh, males were over four times more likely to cooperate if they actually had cooperated before. So long-term social interactions, very important to cooperation in the society. Just like um, our own societies, we tend to keep interacting with um, people that we've cooperated in the past. Finally, this triad closure effect is also really important to explaining the structure of these mannequin societies. That is, if you already share a friend in common, um, you're more likely to um, end up cooperating with each other, closing up your triad. Um, and we see that in our own networks as well. So any, any uh, statistical model, you want to look at how well these models capture reality. What's the goodness and fit of these models? Are they really doing a good job? So I'm going to quickly show you just one example of how I measure that, the most visually appealing way. I've got to show some social networks, of course, since I'm talking about them. So what I have here is one representative social network, a two-year time period from, uh, this is 85 to 86. And what you're seeing here, these circles represent different birds in the network, male birds. The colors represent what perch zone they were at, so what lex site. So blue means that they're at the same site, primarily blacks were at the same site, primarily yellow, and so on and so forth. And the color of the links um, represent whether they had a long-term interaction or not. So the, the orange is kind of reddish color is a representative of a long-term interaction. The black color just represents um, an interaction that just occurred only in that two-year time period. So what you'll notice right away is that space is really important here. You've got blues interacting with blues, blacks mostly interacting with blacks, yellow mostly interacting with yellow. Um, and if we look at what the distance typically was between birds that were interacting, it was around 100 meters or less on average. Next, um, if we look at clustering, which is a measure of how many triads are actually closed up in this network, um, what we found it was fairly high, over 30% of our triads were closed up. And then we also have a number of long-term links as well. How does that compare to what we get from these fitted networks? Do we capture reality really well? Well, it turns out we do. This is from um, the simulated model, from the fitted model. This is a simulation. And you can see we're getting the same types of patterns. We're getting the, the same colors um, interacting mostly with their own color. We're also getting a very similar number of long-term links, about 15 to 20%. And we're getting the same amount of triad closure. About 30% of these triads are closed up. So, with these three effects, we are able to capture what's going on in these mannequin social networks, the cooperation interactions really well. Um, so spatial proximity, long-term interactions, and this kind of friend of a friend triad closure um, type of effect. So just kind of in conclusion, some further musings. These are the same types of processes that we see in our own human networks. Space is really important. Long-term interactions are really important. Triad closure is really important. Um, and so this raises a, maybe this idea that maybe you don't always have to be really cognitively complex to have a complex society. It probably depends on how you define those things. Um, mannequins um, don't have a large brain relative to their body size. Um, and most people would not categorize them as being cognitive complex. They're not using tools or anything like that. But they're still structuring their societies with very similar processes that we use. So just to finish up here, um, I'd like to thank a number of people, especially Ashton and Jim, for all their help over the years. I've really appreciated that. And they've made a big, big impact on my life and the direction that I've taken in my science. Uh, and that's it.